What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Eclectic Beard. This go around, we're going to take a look at the animated history of Ireland. Let's go ahead and get into it. Hopping across the English Channel, we return once again to the British Isles. This time to Ireland, land of fairies and folktales, Christians and pagans, beer and whiskey, and a somewhat troublesome history that propelled the Irish to the world stage in the 1960s. But going back further, the tale gets pretty interesting, and that's certainly not a bias on our part. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the Emerald Isle. Ireland as we know it today is a single island entity and has been united for almost its entirety. This only changed in the 20th century when it became split between two nations, Ireland the country and the United Kingdom. Most of the Emerald Isle's modern citizens did not live before the split, which is why there still tends to be some bitterness about it on both sides. But leaving that aside for the moment, we can begin in 300 BC. The first inhabitants were our good friends the Celts, who migrated from the European continent after the last Ice Age. These Celts flourished in culture and traditions all upon the foundations of their pagan faith. Irish myth and folklore is deep intertwined into Irish poetry and even their later Christian beliefs. Although that doesn't mean it's easy to find. Hi, Tailbot here from the channel Tail Foundry. Unfortunately, a lot of ancient Irish traditions have been lost to time and inattention. The stories we do have records of are really cool, men who become gods, intricate pseudo-histories, an odd abundance of shape-shifting salmon, but it's hard to know whether they're legitimate because the majority of them were recorded by Christian scribes rather than their pagan adherents. On our show, we recently took a shot at unraveling the Irish mythological cycle and the mystery of why it isn't more popular. So, once you're done learning about Ireland's actual history, feel free to come discuss its pseudo-history with us. Thanks for the contribution, Tail Foundry. The Celts of Ireland called their land Eire, after their matron goddess, Eiru. They spoke a language called Gaelic, or what we call Irish. One Irish tribe, the Scotty, is thought to have been the namesake of Scotland. Once again, English misappropriation defies the boundaries of cultural sensitivities. Christianity made its way to Ireland from Roman Britain, largely aided by the Bishop St. Patrick, who managed to convert the Irish from paganism to Catholicism when he wasn't busy chasing snakes. Ireland was raided and settled by the Vikings in the 8th century, setting up small towns that became cities like Dublin and Belfast. But the Vikings were fought off and replaced by the Normans who arrived in 1167, creating what would be... So in the span of... How long was that? Yeah, seven hundred years. That's three different. That's three different sets of people um, barging in. The lordship of Ireland. Norman Ireland failed to control the entire island, though, and many lords and kings existed in tandem with the Norman possessions. By the 1400s, Norman holdings were limited, aided greatly by the War of the Roses and the Black Plague, which killed far more Normans than Irishmen. This changed with King Henry VIII, who took a break from cutting up wives and churches to conquer the various Irish kingdoms. He established the Kingdom of Ireland, which expanded after defeating the Irish in the Desmond Rebellions and the Nine Years' War. In 1604, Ireland was united fully under English rule, and James I of the Scottish House of Stuart became the King of England, uniting all three kingdoms under one monarch. The British, however, were Protestants, and the Catholics of Ireland felt resentment having a Protestant as their ruler, and rebellions were frequent. To gain better control, English monarchs confiscated land from the lords and farmers and replaced them with Protestant English and Scots. Seems to be a lot of that kind of stuff over there. Just, yeah, we we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that you know we can get as little problem as possible. So we're taking your land, we're putting our people over there on it, and uh, yeah, deal with it. It's, it's not the way to take, and it's that's that's how you have people assassinate you. That's what happens. They assassinate because they're pissed. The British hoped that settling Protestants in the area would help quell rebellions by having a population with a distinct British national identity. Wait, wait, wait. They sent Protestants. Seems like you would take me like, all right, so you're a Catholic, you're a Catholic, you're a Catholic. Y'all go over there. Although England at that point is Protestant, still, seems like you'd take and go like with like, so that way 
you know, they're loyalists to you, you know, they're loyal to you, but, uh, you know, they're, they're Catholic. Seems like you, you would try to find people like that, that way, because that's just going to serve to inflame everything. Identity. This worked most successfully in Ulster, where some counties formed majorities of Presbyterians. During the War of the Three Kingdoms, Ireland staged rebellions from British rule, but were defeated by both Oliver Cromwell and later William of Orange shortly after the Glorious Revolution. Theobald Wolfton led a further rebellion which was brutally suppressed. At this point, the British said enough was enough and united the kingdoms into a single country, in order to better control rebellions. The Union was still heavily prejudiced against Catholics though, and this coupled with the Great Potato Famine caused millions to die and millions more to immigrate, most notably for Liverpool and the Americas. The economic hardship and poverty created the Home Rule Movement, in which the Irish citizens demanded their own parliament, with the notable exception of Protestant counties in the north, who were pro-unionist and supported British rule. This surprised entirely no one, since most of these counties were descendants of the British colonists, who had confiscated the Irish lands a century earlier. Home Rule stalled during World War I, leading some Republicans to stage a rebellion known as the Easter Rising. The British attempted to grant Home Rule by splitting the island into two self-governing territories, Northern and Southern Ireland, both of whom were still part of the United Kingdom. Fighting continued however, and Irish civil war ensued with some supporting membership of the British Commonwealth as a free state, and others supporting a full republic. Although the free state won the war, the Republicans did shortly get elected to Parliament and Ireland became a full republic. The split of Ireland angered many Republicans on both sides, who saw it as a British ploy to gerrymander the northern counties to allow for a slight unionist majority and ultimately retain a claim on parts of the island. The anger also came to further intensify the religious divide since most Catholics saw themselves as Irish and supported hey, Republicanism, and most Protestants were pro-union. The bitterness of the Irish Civil War was felt everywhere and discrimination against Catholics was increasing in the north. Peaceful civil rights protests escalated just one decade after the war and a conflict known as the Troubles, which is something you've probably heard of. Various unionist and nationalist <coughs> military groups were formed and the fighting continued for decades. The conflict boiled down to the Good Friday Agreement when Ireland and Northern Ireland agreed to exist in a state of tandem, and if the majority of Northern Irish citizens voted to rejoin Ireland, the governments would allow this to happen. The agreement also affirmed the free movement of people through the border and made allowances for any Northern Irish born in Northern Ireland to attain Irish citizenship if they desire. This largely brought the conflict to an uneasy peace. Kind of. Ireland joined the European Union in 1973 along with the UK and Denmark. The island became very prosperous and economic growth became a large source of immigration. They replaced the old Irish pound with the euro in 1999. The island's prosperity was halted in the 2008 global financial crisis, which significantly reduced Ireland's wealth. Many on both sides of the border have toyed around with the idea of reunification, and some have compared the situation to the division of East and West Germany. Resistance to unification is said to be waning somewhat, even though some are still fiercely opposed. The discomfort of the division once again came to a head with the vote of Britain to leave the EU, angering many who don't want to see a border erected between the two parts of the island. The slim majority of the Northern Irish voted to remain within the EU, bringing up a degree of resentment to the UK for forcibly removing them from it. Talks about the reunification of Ireland began immediately, and the idea has shown growing support, especially with the Scottish intention on holding a second independence referendum. Some view Irish unification as inevitable as older generations pass for an increasingly more liberal world, and yet others too are skeptical. I guess only time will tell. All right, so that for a small island, that's quite a bit of history. It's quite interesting to a reason why I decided to take a look at this because uh, looking at the troubles, I figured this would be another good thing to look at. History of Ireland. I love how they condense stuff like that. You know, how stuff like this is condensed by channels. Awesome content they put out. Um, just that's. That's the one thing I was wondering. I was like, well, how is it that part of Ireland is like, no, we're part of the, we're part of, you know, Great Britain, you know, we're part of the, the UK. We're, we're cool. And the other parts, like, no, we're our own, we're our own entity. But now, taking and watching this, it, it makes sense. In a way, it, it makes sense because, like, it showed, you, you know, whenever they took and sent folks over to try to, after, after removing landowners and stuff like that, after England sent people over 
Northern part, you know, they're like, all right, cool. We're, you know, we, we agree with, with them over there still. And the rest of the country's like, no. Nope. I could see how that longstanding thing could take and lead to what we, what we see. But I can also, you know, the fact that the, there's a lot of support growing towards reunification and being, you know, one full one full state or one full country over there um, rejoining Ireland. It, it's, it's just, it's fascinating to me, all the, the history, because it's just so, it runs, number one, for so long, but also just some of the divides and some of the disagreements and the prejudices and the grudges are just, they run, for, they run so deep. And that's, to me, stuff like that is fascinating. So, um, Y'all be good to each other. Love yourselves. Peace.